the first thing we have to say about Wagner is the sheer scale of it. You, you can't really begin to discuss music at all without this huge thing which is in front of you, you know, this great mountain of work. Um, secondly, uh, he has an extraordinary emotional access to audiences. Um, uh, obviously, not all audiences, there's some people actually resist Wagner quite strongly, possibly because they sense that they're being overwhelmed by the music, that they're being uh, um, deliberately stirred up in a way which they feel they can't quite control, which, in my view, is exactly what Wagner wanted to do. He completely astounded his contemporaries uh, with his harmonic progressions, his compositional procedure, and again, by this titanic feeling of, uh, of the music. And nobody had ever heard anything remotely like it before. <laughs> I wonder if, as a man of the theatre, you, you could explain how Parsifal works. There is the, all of the action apparently happens before the opera starts, and then for four hours, five including intervals, really very little happens. Why is it so extraordinarily spellbinding? Yeah, well, that is a very tricky one to answer, and it, it's in the territory of genius, that's all. It's all recapitulation, it's all analysis, um, but what Wagner, what it meant to Wagner, the, the, this, 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 this journey towards reconciliation um, and healing and transfiguration uh, was so potent in Wagner's own mind, he endowed it with such extraordinary musical qualities. So, it, something, I mean, Every time, actually, that Wagner creates an opera, he creates this world of sound that has n never been heard before. And Parsifal is the most extreme example of it. And you just have to hear the prelude again to know that you're in another place, mentally, emotionally, in philosophically. You know you're somewhere else. It's so rarefied and so sick. It's, it's full of pain, bleeding, death, but magic alchemized into something utterly, utterly, and to me, hypnotically compelling. And if you really, if you do approach, if you come to Parsifal and you think, um, where's the story? When is something going to happen? Then you're a bit doomed. You have to kind of relax and say, no, this is like um, mag magic mushroom time. You just, time is utterly changed in this thing. And he was working, I mean, while he was composing it, first of all, it's steeped in Schopenhauer and, and that whole idea of the suspension of time and the suspension of space, even, of being in another dimension. And this opera is in another dimension. And you, 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 you just have to allow the spell to take hold of you. Now, many people resent that deeply and think that's a bad procedure for art, that you shouldn't, it shouldn't be about casting spells. It should be about opening up your human sort of awareness, that, uh, uh, you know, your awareness of your fellow humans' lives, as when you see a play of Shakespeare. You don't experience that sense of spell. You don't go to a trance while you're watching a Shakespeare play. On the contrary, you're keen to find out how, uh, what's the outcome. <clears throat> That's not what Wagner's about at all. It's not what he's interested in. He's interested in, in this, in, in this I I incredible um, uh, hypnotic, um, uh, deep, deep hypnotic trance, so that he reaches into parts of the human experience that no other music does. He's, he's deliberately trying to get down into your unconscious. He's trying to transcend the analytical brain completely. He, he wants to go to the sort of essence or something of a human being.
Well, that leads me on to the question, is it possible to enjoy the music without any eye uh, on the ideology at all? Oh, I think it's perfectly possible to enjoy Wagner without, without knowing uh, anything about the ideology. Um, I mean, you might feel, you, you know, Woody Allen's famous joke about when I hear too much Wagner, I feel the urge to invade Poland is, is, is actually a very, you know, um, uh, uh, relevant joke in a way. It, 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 there is something unnerving about uh, Wagner's, uh, this, this, this ever swelling, this, this, this uh, I repeat, overpowering feeling that he uh, um, creates. Uh, it sort of tends to wipe things out. Um, in a way uh, that, uh, uh, you know, again, Debussy is a reaction precisely against that. Debussy uh, tried to re revert to a, a French, a very specifically French language, precisely to um, cleanse the palate, as it were. There's something sort of cloying, in a way, about Wagner's palate, uh, but delicious, you know, I mean, deeply, deeply delicious. Let's be clear, uh, the anti-Semitism in Wagner is not part of his musical ideology at all, despite the rather laboured attempts of some people to suggest that you know, Beckmesser's music, for example, is, is based on versions of Jewish harmonic progressions of Jewish music. I, I don't hold much truck with that. There's no simple answer on the matter of the ideology. It really isn't the case that Wagner was, as it were, uh, the Nazi party in musical form. There's no sense of that at all. Wagner despised militarism. He was severely critical of imperialism. He didn't like the Second Reich, Bismarck's Second Reich. Wagner disliked intensely uh, for those reasons, because it was imperialistic, because it was uh, militaristic, but also because Bismarck gave the Jews the vote and, uh, and didn't discourage them from breeding. So th there you go, there's more of the, the complexity of Wagner. <laughs> The final question is actually a question from you. You have to imagine not me sitting in this chair, but Wagner. Ah. And you're allowed to put a question to him. There must be something that you'd like him to clear up for you. And if so, what would it be? Uh, um, actually, Wagner's very transparent, you know. One sort of really well understands why he did what he did at all, or, or, or really well, all stages. Um, uh, I would really, of course, like to ask him, uh, um, what his opera about the Buddha would have been like, because that's something that he toyed with towards the end of his life. He was going to write uh, uh, an opera about the Buddha. But then he decided that after Parzival, he wouldn't write any more operas. He'd gone as far down the operatic route as he could. So after that, he said, he was going to write symphonies. And I would love to have had that conversation with him. What kind of orchestral music was he going to write as the culmination of all of his uh, musical work. Because, uh, might, you know, who knows, maybe that isn't a medium that suited him, but, but, but if he'd done to symphonic music what he did to opera, then we would have heard some pretty astonishing sounds. <laughs>